Hey everybody, it's Benny One, and I'm back at you with that last Harry Potter movie review, everybody. And we are on Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2, everybody. That's right, the last and eighth movie in the Harry Potter storyline. And then we're moving on to the Fantastic Beast trilogy, everyone. That's right. So, we are finally here. The big ending epic like Return of the King style Harry Potter movie, everyone. After we got left off with part one, very sad, dim, gloom, just very dark, depressing Deathly Hollows part one movie, everyone, where Dobby dies at the end of the movie. Whoo! So we pick up, basically, we pick up right where uh, Voldemort cracked open freaking Dumbledore's grave and stole the elder wand everyone and then it picks up with harry and ron and hermione um talking to ollivander about the elder wand and the deathly hollows and he says they're just stories and he's like well sir he actually found it <laughs> and he's like well i'm sorry kids but basically if he really did find it and what you're saying is true you really don't stand a chance he basically tells them they're screwed <laughs> i was like well okay that's cool. A guy that literally knows everything about wands is like, yeah, you guys are fucked. <laughs> I'm like, okay, here we go, everyone. So then there's basically two parts to this movie, two story parts and locations and settings for the most part. So the first part of our movie, our opening probably like, I don't know, it's about a 30 minute scene maybe total from the beginning to where that part ends. Harry, Ron, and Hermione need to break into um the damn bank in um the Diagon Alley they need to break into the bank and in down in a safe they know that because of Bellatrix and her safe there is a horcrux in her safe and she thinks that the sword of Gryffindor is in her safe but it was a fake it was a fake that was put in there because nobody can actually own the sword of gryffindor um so they grip hook the um the little um uh goblin dude that worked at the bank in diagon alley which originally was played by um Vern troyer in the first harry potter movie but um, is played by somebody else. I think Warwick Davis is who plays him in this one. And they made him look basically the same. So they did a good job at that. So Hermione takes a uh, Polyjuice potion and turns into Bellatrix Lestrange. And her and Ron and Harry and Griphook go and break into this bank and get into the vault. And they do find the Horcrux, of course. But then there's a spell put on everything that's touched in her vault duplicates and replicates and just keeps producing and producing and producing and then there's a dragon down here that they get by and it gets involved when they get caught by security and ron harry and hermione bust out on this dragon that has been chained up and locked underneath underground for who knows how long you can tell that it's skinny it's just sickly looking and when it gets outside for the first time when it busts out of that bank I can't remember the bank, the name of the bank. I'm sorry. Like I said, all them hardcore, the really, really hardcore Harry Potter fans. I watch these movies every year and I still can't remember shit. So, sorry. Um, but you can tell when that dragon gets out and it's just sitting up there breathing that air. You can see it going, <sighs> it's just like, ah, I'm free. You can just tell that they've had it locked down there for a long time. And I love attention to detail like that. So, but that's basically the opening part of the movie. And then the other like two hours of the movie all basically take place at Hogwarts or right around Hogwarts, outside of Hogwarts. Like it literally takes place there. That's where our big epic final battle is going to take and showdown is going to go on, which I think is just awesome. We get to see the destruction of Hogwarts. Like they're just the fight. And everything because there's basically two big fight sequences that take place because Harry and the Order end up sneaking into Hogwarts because Snape has become headmaster of Hogwarts um and here's one thing I don't quite understand so Jeannie was at the wedding in the Deathly Hollows part one and they knew that like 
the, that Voldemort and his cronies had totally taken over the ministry. They knew that Snape was the headmaster at Hogwarts. But when we pick up in this movie, Ginny is... Because in between the time that they left the wedding and when they end back up at Hogwarts from the Ho Deathly Hallows Part 1 and 2, I think there was about a three-month three gap where they were gone, where Ron, Harry, and Hermione were gone looking for Horcruxes. Like, but I still don't understand why Ginny, after knowing what's going on because her parents are with the Order and everything, why they would send her back to Hogwarts. I don't understand that part i never have understood that and i'm not quite sure why they allowed her to go back to hogwarts when they're being tortured and everything with that stupid pen that makes it that comes on their arm and everything i don't know why they would let her go back but yes so we pick up and they sneak into hogwarts and harry confronts snape in the grand hall and calls him a coward and he's like you tell him you tell him about that night and how you turned your back. I was like, yeah, get him, Harry. And, of course, McGonagall, man, McGonagall gets to shine in this movie. She steps in front of Harry and freaking starts shooting flames and shit at Snape. And she calls him a coward when he runs away and takes off through the window and everything. Awesome moment for her. And when she does that spell to tell all those stone uh military armored dudes that come falling down to protect the castle and she's like i've always wanted to use that spell to freaking ron and genie's mom just awesome stuff there's all sorts of action in this movie and this movie is just payoff like complete payoff when you're telling this grand long over the years it was 10 years that they told the story in these movies these eight movies because they split this last book into two movies of course because of the money 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 and stuff and it also helped flush out the story and a lot of characters just it, they do such a good job with this where they took time and they took movies to develop and tell this story and it's just all payoff and like so many characters get moments to shine in this final big epic showdown battle that takes place at Hogwarts, Neville really gets time to shine. Like, man, they really give him a spotlight in this movie. And I think it's awesome. Like, he was just this scared little chubby little boy and everything in the early movies. And he's just a badass swinging the Gryffindor sword and standing up to Voldemort when you think Harry dies. Because the big reveal in this movie which we finally get to see about Snape, which if you read the book, you already knew, but if they still did a fantastic job in the movie of putting it on the big screen. Like, you find out when Snape gets killed by Voldemort because he says that the one, because Snape killed Dumbledore, so the Elder Wand does not obey Voldemort. It's, it's kind of cracking when he's using it, and you can tell that, like, he's not the actual owner of that wand. Snape is, because Snape disarmed Dumbledore, which you don't really find out about this kind of stuff until, I think, like, the actual, the last movie, basically. They don't really dive into that kind of stuff until the seventh movie, which I found was kind of weird. I felt like that should have been something that should have been explored and explained earlier on in the movies, but... This is a little nitpick. Um, so yes, Voldemort kills Snape. He freaking slashes his throat and then he lets Nagini freaking just attack the shit out of him. And Harry, Ron, and Hermione are down by this boat dock barn thing listening to all this going on outside and watching this snake just kill him. So they go in and Snape tells him there's tears coming out of his eyes and he tells him to tease like, take them, take them as he's like dying and Harry's like, Ugh. and... So he takes him so he can go to that little vision puddle bowl thing. I don't know what the fuck it's called. I'm sorry. Like I said, I've watched these movies a shit ton, but I can't remember names of things. I apologize, okay? Um, so yes, and he dies and he does the whole thing like you have your mother's eyes. Because he, he loved his mom, which we find out through this vision. Um, I think it's called the Pontiage or whatever that thing's called. I may have said it. I don't freaking know. Um... But he gets the vision and the backstory of Dumbledore and Snape talking. And they show how Snape 
and his mother Lily were friends and when they went to Hogwarts like obviously James and she started to fall in love with James but Snape never stopped loving her and we find out that after Snape was embedded with Voldemort and he was working for Dumbledore the whole time the first time around he said that he would do anything for Dumbledore and he would help him as long as he kept Lily and Jane like them safe from Voldemort and he didn't and that's when you find out that Harry is a Horcrux. He was accidentally created as a Hor like he didn't Voldemort didn't mean to make Harry a Horcrux, but he accidentally did. Um, and he explains to him that that's why Harry has to die. The only way to kill Voldemort is Harry has to die. And there's a pretty deep line where Snape is like, "So you've just been basically raising him like a pig for slaughter." And Dumbledore is basically like, yeah, he doesn't say yeah, but he was like, oh, don't tell me you've actually grown to like the boy and shit. And it's just like, he did. He actually grew to care for Harry. And it's just some very deep emotional shit that happens with Snape. And if you go into these movies not knowing about that, man, what a curveball thrown in your face. I just can't even imagine how I would have felt watching these movies and not knowing that like because I knew about it because I read the books but it's just a very deep emotional thing that happened and you see Snape in Dumbledore's office do the Patronus charm with the dough Lily's dough and Dumbledore's like Lily oh and Snape's like always and I'm like okay it's just like so yes Harry dies but he comes back there's this weird scene with him and Dumbledore in this train station where it's all white and it's basically like the spot where you go um when you're dead before you go to heaven or hell or whatever I don't really know and then there was that creepy little nasty Voldemort sitting under the bench which to me that represented the part of Voldemort's soul that was latched on to Harry as a Horcrux. That's what that represented, was that little nasty, ugly Voldemort from the fourth Harry Potter movie laying under that bench dying and bleeding. That's what that represented was, is that part of Voldemort's soul died. So they were good to kill him. They were So when Harry comes back, and then we get the big, last, epic, final fight and showdown, which is just epic. It's just seriously epic. It's awesome. It's like Return of the King-style shit. The payoff and everything. You just get to see all of our characters be badasses, be heroic. And obviously they win in the end of the day. Harry has the Elder Wand at the end. Of course people die. Um, one of Ron's twin brothers died. Um, I can't remember if it was George or... I can't remember which one died. But, um, but yes, people die. Hogwarts is just torn to shit. But it just, the movie's so good because it gives you everything that you want in the big ending story in this eight movie epic franchise. Like it's just, the payoff is just alone is worth the price to watch this movie or whatever. Like it just, it really is. And when Harry and them are standing on the bridge at the end of the movie and he breaks the Elder Wand and throws it off the bridge, I'm like, yeah, that's Harry. Like, he doesn't think anybody needs the most powerful wand to be the most powerful wizard. So he's like, eh, it's mine, but I'm going to break it and I'm going to throw it off the bridge. And that's where the movie should have ended. But we get the Return of the King thing where we get another ending where they jump ahead years where their kids, Harry and Ron and Hermione and Jeannie, their kids are all going to Hogwarts for their first year of school. Uh, Malfoy's even there. Him and Harry do the little, mm, yep. We respect each other. We used to hate each other. And they made everyone look older. But, yeah, the guys looked really... Ron looked pretty good, I will say. He had a little beer belly going on, you know. Um, probably drinks too much damn wizard beer. He looked good. But, man, Malfoy and Harry and Jeannie being de-aged. Hermione looked good, too. But, man, those three, whew, they... They could have did a better job at the makeup on that. And they did reshoot that whole little end sequence with them getting the kids on board Hogwarts Express. I don't think it was needed, but it was kind of cool. If they ever do the Cursed Child movie, it'll tie into that really well. So, yeah, guys, the Harry Potter franchise, bam, we are done with the eight initial Harry Potter movies. I'm going to give Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2, I'm giving this thing a 9 out of 10. 
very, very, very satisfying, payoff, action-packed, ending, epic battle movie to these eight Harry Potter movies, everyone. So a 9 out of 10. And remember, we're moving on to the Fantastic Beasts trilogy after this, and then we will rank all these movies. Shabingi. All right, everyone. I hope I, you enjoyed that review. I thank you for watching, and I'll be catching you on the two bagers because I have spoken.